I think everyone knows who we have and, presenting uh, today. We've got Fuchsia Howard and Susan DeHinton, but we're really pleased to have them here because they have some unique expertise around um, navigating the myriad of options are when it comes to literature reviews and knowledge synthesis methods, and uh, particularly around guiding graduate students in terms of which ones they want to choose. Um, so we're very pleased to, to be able to learn from their uh, experiences today. Thank you, Mary Lee. Yes, yeah, so both Pusha and I have, uh, as part of our teaching across all of the uh, programs, undergraduate, master's, and doctoral, we both discuss different types of literature reviews and knowledge synthesis. Uh, and what we've learned over time is that there's all kinds of types or terms used for different types, that there's a lot of inconsistency in the literature, a lot of ambiguity. And, and I think as we were putting together this presentation, we actually came up with more questions and reflections than answers. So this, uh, what we're going to be talking to you about today, is very much a work in progress. Um, it also reflects a little bit of the evolution of knowledge around knowledge synthesis and systematic and what different types of reviews that we see out there. Yeah. And in particular, I'll try to answer some of the questions that I often got asked as a coordinator of the master's program. Okay, so uh, basically uh, we'll talk about definitions of uh, different types of literature reviews, knowledge synthesis, and even are they the same thing. Uh, uh, selecting the appropriate design, a little bit of an overview on procedures, but we're not really going into procedures. We're going to talk more about the issues and some of the controversies, but hopefully we can clear up uh, a few points of confusion and contention. So I think uh, a lot of faculty will have seen this diagram and many students. So this came out of uh, a package that uh, Bernie Garrett put together when we were first proposing that rapid evidence appraisals could be done as a master's thesis. And he, uh, he drew on uh, another UBC document. And so what we see is that this figure is saying there's a continuum basically about the confidence we have in different types of review uh, studies, uh, starting with a narrative review, whatever that may be, because narrative reviews can refer to so many different types of reviews. Quick scoping review, then a rapid evidence assessment, up to a full systematic review. We think this oversimplifies the issues in that it's not all about, we can't just talk about confidence in reviews. One of the main reasons is the different types of reviews have a different purpose. So we might have uh, a lot of confidence in a scoping review for what it's trying to accomplish, uh, which would be different than what a rapid evidence uh, review might do. Uh, also, quality matters, and so it's not just the quality of the studies that go into the particular review and how it's done, but also the relevance of those studies that are included. And, oh, and then that whole issue of quality, which can mean so many different things to different people. Um, so we've tried to build on this. And so we acknowledge there's some kind of continuum, whether it's about rigor or confidence or something else, something more complex, we don't really know. But we agree that the systematic reviews, of which there are many, many types, uh, are very, very rigorous and we can have a lot of confidence in the findings that they are providing. Rapid evidence review being... Uh, Sorry, the audio is... Uh, audio is okay. Rapid evidence review being... A more, uh, 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 less, less what? Um, Maybe it's a scaled a down, down version. version. <laughs> scaled down version, right? And then yeah. scoping reviews that were also talked about in that other diagram. But what they didn't mention was integrative reviews. And I think for our graduate students, our master's students in particular, we're seeing a lot of integrative reviews, and we see a lot of need even among practice nurses, uh, as well as how they're used uh, in, for, in graduate work. So the guidelines for SPAR projects for masters uh, suggest doing a scoping review or integrative review, not doing a rapid evidence assessment unless there's very few um, studies, because a rapid evidence assessment takes more work and uh, is appropriate for a thesis. Generally, it's faculty working in a research team that might do a system. OK, 
okay, of doctoral students uh, doing a systematic review for their uh, dissertation work. Uh, but this doesn't cover all the types of reviews. Okay. Now something else isn't working. Oh, okay, so we'll also talk about realist reviews and and that generic literature review that we see in chapter two of thesis and uh, dissertations. But there's a lot of other types of reviews, and uh, one of the uh, uh, one piece of literature about reviews can identify 25 different types of reviews. Now, a lot of them are giving the same name to very similar types of reviews. A lot of the names are very confusing. And some of the individual methods used in the different reviews do different things depending on the overarching sort of method they're trying to use. So there's conflation between what is a methodology in terms of review and what are the individual methods being actually used in the review. Yeah. Okay, so let's start by defining literature review and knowledge synthesis and whether they're the same thing. So we thought it would be a good idea to start with what is a conventional literature review? This is something I think we're all relatively familiar with, but a good, a good place to start. So really it attends to mature topics, right? Thinking about how can we reconceptualize existing knowledge. But it can also be about thinking about new topics in preparation uh, for uh, preliminary conceptualization. These conventional literature reviews tend to be much more broad and general in purpose as opposed to a more clear question which we see in the, in the knowledge synthesis, which we'll get to. They do incorporate empirical studies, as we all know, uh, but of various different designs, as well as other types of literature. So it may draw on theoretical types of literature, or, uh, other types of thinking. Uh, the important thing about literature reviews is they're actually quite important still, and they can be very useful when carefully executed in terms of preparing for practice projects or preparing for research. Uh, they can set the stage, for identifying what's been done, what hasn't been done, so where are those gaps in the literature, thinking about drawing our attention to the, the important parts in the research, so important research questions, as well as helping to develop our conceptual frameworks and approaches for thinking about things like data collection, data analysis. The problem with older conventional styles of, of literature reviews is they really have been criticized for being less systematic in that they didn't use specific methods to identify, examine, critique, and synthesize the literature. So it's this last part, this less systematic, that's been the real problem with, with um, conventional reviews. So that brings us to what, what do we mean by a knowledge synthesis? So the old terminology was literature reviews, and now we see knowledge synthesis everywhere, right? But there's really, they're used interchangeably. The question is, should they all be used interchangeably? <laughs> yeah, or do they actually indicate something different? Um, so the purpose, this is really drawing from CIHR. They say the purpose of a knowledge synthesis is for decision support, right? It's to support people uh, in policy or in terms of evidence-based practice. But knowledge, knowledge synthesis can also be knowledge support. So developing new knowledge uh, for the sake of new knowledge, right? It may not necessarily be put into practice right away. Uh, CI Charles also says that a knowledge synthesis is the contextualization and integration of research findings of individual research, research studies within this larger body of knowledge. So one individual study within the context of all the other studies similar to it. They also say that a synthesis must be reproducible and transparent when it comes to methods, and those methods can be qualitative, quantitative studies. So we take issue uh, with a couple of things in this, in this definition. The first being that it's the integration or contextualization of research studies. And what we see in a lot of knowledge synthesis is it includes other types of evidence beyond an empirical study. So it can draw on things like gray literature. It can draw on things like theoretical or conceptual knowledge. 
The second is this sort of narrow idea of reproducibility. When we think about reproduce, reproducibility, it's in the context of quantitative, you know, post-positivist type research. And so it fails to capture uh, much of what synthesis might be. So those are just two of the issues that we see with definition, with this definition. So what makes a synthesis actually systematic? So Cochrane, the Cochrane collaboration, would say that you used a predetermined structure uh, to search, screen, select, appraise, and summarize the studies and their findings to answer a very narrow focused question. But what is systematic and how systematic actually varies, and that can vary by the type of knowledge synthesis as well as the methods that are being used. Uh, and we are drawing on an article recently published by Green Hawthorne and Melterud, I think that's how you say her name, who draw our attention to the idea that systematic is much more broad than reproducible. And they say that systematic is coming to acquire a broader meaning in terms of trans, as well as appropriateness of methods. And this is in contrast to strictly adhering to guidelines or a predefined tool or checklist for doing a review. So it's a much more broad idea uh, and conceptualization of systematic. This is like, is this like uh oh, I may have messed up the animation though. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the three types of reviews that our master's students might do as a SPAR or thesis. And we will make the argument that they are all knowledge synthesis projects. So, and when I talk about them, we'll talk about them in relationship to different features that can vary across designs. So uh, as we said earlier, did these different types of reviews really have a different purpose and therefore you'll see very different research questions for each of them, or we should. Uh, the type of literature that's included varies, whether it's all research studies. If so, what type of designs? Do you include theoretical literature? Do you include gray literature, some of which might be research, some not, only published literature? Uh, one thing that is, is consistent is that the search strategy is always systematic and that it should be uh, documented and the search should be reproducible because that's more objective. Uh, one comment I want to make is when students are doing uh, or want to do one of these types of knowledge synthesis projects, they have to start out by reading the literature somewhat just to identify the need for, for the review. Uh, then once they've determined a search strategy, uh, they, it, it's all, often iterative that the, if the search strategy doesn't come up with what one's looking for, you may have to rethink the research question and that part will go back and forth. Selection strategies uh, can vary a little bit in terms of procedure. Data extraction is something we always expect to see because the different pieces of the literature for data for this new research study, the Knowledge Synthesis Project. Uh, we do see some differences between literature reviews and knowledge synthesis, is what I'd argue. Um, and with that data that's being extracted is data about the study itself, the study characteristics, as well as the findings of the study. Where we see the most uh, uh, difference is in quality appraisal, whether or not it's required and what type of appraisal, how formal or informal. And in terms of analysis or synthesis, this is really the findings of the uh, knowledge synthesis research project. But we will see variation in how systematically that's done. And actually that's a point that's uh, really not well defined. So let's look at each of these. Now, uh, so uh, one of the uh, authors says that the integrative literature review is a distinctive form of research that generates new knowledge about the topic. So he would be agreeing that this is a knowledge synthesis type of knowledge synthesis. So integrative review uh, methods are really the broadest because it can provide this comprehensive understanding of some phenomena. Uh, we think of generally our students are looking at some kind of healthcare problem, which would be maybe understanding the problem more, so knowledge support, or, or findings that will inform practice decisions. Uh, Whitmore and Naffel are authors that a lot of students refer to. They talk about uh, 
these projects uh, enabling uh, definition of concepts, uh, reviewing theories, evidence, or analyzing methodological issues. So the research que question can be directed at different topics. Uh, but again, it will generate uh, new frameworks and perspectives when you put it all together. And uh, as we mentioned before, yeah, you can look at mature topics, which might bring a new, new or reconceptualization when you look at the whole body of literature, or if it's a new topic, to really bring some a more holistic conceptualization and synthesis to that literature. The type of literature that's uh, typically in, included is research uh, studies of all different types, theoretical literature, gray literature. It might be best practice guidelines, anything that's going to answer that research question. So very broad type of literature. Basically, all of the uh, search recommendations will say it should, uh, that it should be comprehensive, but then they may be limited. And the way I interpret that is it should be comprehensive around your research uh, question. And so your inclusion and exclusion criteria, that's what will then limit. So, uh, and this should be documented exactly what are you looking for and what type of literature. So you can, uh, students will often limit to published articles in peer-reviewed journals, which is a form of quality uh, control, particular uh, disciplines or publication years. Uh, the, there should be uh, two to three strategies used. So not just database searching, but you can do some journal hand searching of a particular uh, field or ancestry searching through the reference lists. And there should be some kind of appraisal, but for graduate students, we would say this can be a more informal uh, type of appraisal. And uh, sometimes I've advised students to really just look at the strengths and limitations of particular studies. Um, but uh, some students will inc include a quality score, but there's really no gold standard about how to do this. Appraising theoretical literature is a little bit more difficult, but you can look at the credibility. What's the background of the, uh, of the authors? Uh, is this in their field? What's the logic? Things like that. But what, because it's going to be different types of literature, uh, each type of literature can be appraised in a different way, and that probably makes the most sense. Okay. Um, as I said, data analysis strategy is really not uh, well uh, developed. Some students will write specific enough research questions that their data analysis and synthesis can be based on the findings in the studies that answer the question when they bring it together. Other students look for themes, uh, so either of those work. But basically, it's a qualitative analysis, as is all types of data analysis except for medicine meta-analysis uh, types of systematic reviews. And so basically looking for patterns, looking for similarities and differences across the studies. And again, that analysis could be done sequentially by type of literature for the, what, what do we see in the quantitative literature and the qualitative literature and then bring that together. So uh, one, uh, an example here in breast cancer research and treatment was looking at patient reported factors that are associated with adherence to therapy. And so this could have a, a incorporated a broad range of uh, research and other literature. And this was, uh, just to know, yeah. this was by one of our graduate students. This is part of her dissertation research. She looked at qualitative and quantitative patient reported factors in the literature, and that became part of her dissertation research. We all have a handout on uh, uh, references for the methods. So uh, there's a couple for integrative reviews. So there's been a lot more written in the literature about scoping reviews. The problem is when you read them, you're not sure, oh, are they really talking about an integrative review or starting to talk about a kind of a rapid review? So we're using a particular definition for a scoping review that uh, starts with Arxi and O'Malley's work in 2005. And the purpose is really quite different. This is really to map out the literature or address a very broad rather than a specific question. Uh, Joanna Briggs Institute has uh, good information on scoping reviews. So you, we're really looking at the size and the scope of the literature. Uh, it lets, uh, really lets us identify where there's uh, research gaps and quite appropriate when the literature is uh, relatively new. Find out what's being written about, what's being researched, where should the research, 
where should research go? And again, just like the integrative reviews, you'll see that uh, it includes a range of literature, research studies, theoretical, gray literature. We want to know what's out there, what's being researched, even if it hasn't been published yet. So now this one would say we really do want a very comprehensive search because we're trying to map the literature. Uh, appraisal. Uh, Arxian O'Malley uh, uh, back in 2005 in the Joanna Briggs Institute is still saying really it's not about doing a quality appraisal because you're not bringing a really bringing a synthesis to the findings. Um, Although some other researchers have said, yes, a quali uh, quality appraisal would be useful, but then you have to look at what type of, always look at what the research question is, whether or not quality appraisal would be helpful. And so for analysis and synthesis, what we want to do is map the quantity and the characteristics of the literature. What kind of things are being written about? Now, we would say that research findings isn't being synthesized, we're not looking at uh, weight of evidence, so is this knowledge, knowledge synthesis or not? We're going to argue it is because it's telling us something new. It's telling us about the state of the field. So even though there's not a synthesis of these findings per se, it, the findings are going to be more descriptive. What's being written about? And why is this being done? Because we don't know. And so that's what often a scoping review might be done if researchers are thinking about doing a more complex systematic review, finding out what has been written. Has there been enough uh, empirical uh, research, enough quantitative studies to do a meta-analysis or not? So this could be a first uh, step. And as I said, there's a number of uh, references for doing scoping reviews. Uh, rapid evidence assessment, so we can get, uh, think about those as an abbreviated form of a systematic review, and as uh, they're often used in response to a clinical or policy question. So this is going to have the narrowest research question. Uh, so we could say it's to provide uh, healthcare professionals, service planners, policy makers with uh, timely and rigorous reviews of the literature that's going to support some kind of decision making. There are two types of questions. One are the impact questions, like does a particular intervention work or not, or, or what, what type of intervention is uh, optimal? And so here we would see the research questions going to be uh, written like a PICO question or a PO question, such as does uh, uh, teen anorexia support groups re reduce anorexia nervosa hospitalization? But there's also uh, impact questions that can be done. We can look at uh, needs of a particular population, the process of an intervention, uh, uh, how it's implemented, and then the correlation questions, just looking for associations, what's been shown about association between different concepts or different phenomena. Uh, and these the questions can be less narrowly defined. With the impact questions, it needs to be very, uh, very narrowly defined. And the same thing, methods are less developed for those. Yeah. So with this work, with our graduate students yes. who are in practice, who are observing things being done, that there's no evidence for doing them that way? Excellent, yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. So here, the focus tends to be on research literature. Well, it is on research literature because we're looking for those answers. Uh, again, the search uh, should be comprehensive in terms of whatever the research question is. Uh, gray literature may be limited, and uh, research designs may be limited. Students may look only for uh, uh, clinical trials. This one does require a more formal systematic quality appraisal because we are looking at the synthesis is going to look at the weight of the evidence. So it will consider the strength of the evidence, the direction of the results, but also the consistency of the results, and the generalizability. How well do these studies apply to the population of interest? So the key differences, I uh, would say that integrative review is the most broadly focused in terms of the purpose, empirical and non-empirical literature is used, and that there can be an informal quality appraisal. Scoping review uses a similar kind of literature, but quality appraisal uh, is not usually done. 
and the REA is the most similar to a systematic review, the most focused, it's only empirical literature, and there should be a quality, a formal quality appraisal. One thing yeah. to add though, back to yeah. the, um, the rapid evidence assessment, we have seen some of our students doing these, uh, usually in the form of a thesis, but there are students who would perhaps do an REA, but with fewer studies. So maybe, you know, four studies. And that would look more like a SPAR because the, the extent and the, the, you know, how much work it is, is actually less. So we have seen the REAs be used as both SPAR or thesis options. Yes. When we were thinking about the continuum, the only thing we could really agree on was they really represented amount of work if you look across. <laughs> Uh, just very, very quickly, there's different resources uh, to guide quality assessments of studies, so the Cochrane Risk of Bias, this was uh, aimed at clinical trials and RCTs, can be adjusted somewhat for non-randomized designs, but really looking at quantitative studies. But uh, Cochrane is looking at putting out information uh, for rapid reviews. Uh, the UK has uh, a weight of evidence document that's only three questions asked about how trustworthy do you think this is, is the uh, design appropriate, and is it relevant to your question. Uh, there's a Maryland scale also came from the UK, and uh, it's looking or appropriate for impact studies, and really there's these five levels, all they're representing is the uh, design really, think of it like a hierarchy of evidence. Uh, CASP has um, eight different tools for different designs, both qualitative and quantitative, and that's one that students will often go to for appraising their qualitative uh, uh, studies. Joanna Briggs Institute, we like this one. Again, it's there's nine different tools for different types of studies. They have a nice list of criteria for each of them. So it's, uh, it's kind of a comprehensive list, but straightforward, and it's it's feasible. I the only, it's, yeah. it's the most absolute friendly of all the quality appraisal assessment tools because it provides some examples, yeah. it provides more description that students can draw on the other way. Yeah, the only thing it doesn't do is really help with that final decision because in the end you have to decide are you going to exclude that study based on your appraisal or are you going to weight it in some way when you're doing your synthesis? So it's also very internationally friendly, how we've been yeah. Brazil and UK and Australia, I mean, it's deep yeah. universally. Yeah. Their whole package of reasons, kind of rationale of why. And we see students doing that quite acceptable. I think it's, oh, okay. These questions we may have time to discuss later. Uh, some of them you should be able to answer already, but this last one, looking at faculty and student roles, is where we hope to uh, hear from our audience. We hope to end up there. Keep that in mind. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to move on to is thinking about um, not just scoping reviews and integrative reviews, rapid reviews, but also t uh, revisiting systematic reviews. And by systematic reviews, we're actually referring to not just the traditional, uh, conventional idea of a systematic review, but we're including systematic reviews as meta-analyses, those ones that also are uh, a narrative systematic review, but then the qualitative systematic reviews as well. And then we're going to talk a little bit about these mixed reviews. So we don't quite know the terminology yet. You'll hear mixed synthesis, qualitative, quantitative, a number of different labels uh, for integrating both qualitative and quantitative in a systematic way. There are also a number of uh, new emerging methods like realist uh, review that we'll just touch on briefly. Um, and then we're going to come back to this idea of what is a literature review in the context of our students and what's one of the big questions that really comes up when we're talking with students. Uh, before we move on to this, one of the things that we want to mention in terms of the differentiation between sort of these reviews that sit over here and are on more this side of the continuum is perhaps the idea that you need more than one person doing these alternate types of reviews. And so that's one of the sort of defining characteristics. Um, this is not going to be new for many of you. Uh, this is just a, a description of what is a traditional quantitative systematic review. 
right? So traditionally, it's to the purpose is to identify, appraise, synthesize all the empirical evidence specific to a very focused question. And as we know, it usually deals with efficacy or effectiveness of interventions, right? So they're usually systematic reviews of RCTs. Uh, the search is comprehensive and exhaustive. So if you have a research question for a review, then in a traditional systematic review, you must have every study that is relevant to that particular research question. Also, the search is very narrow. Uh, and you screen studies out on narrow inclusion and exclusion criteria. So anything that varies a little bit from your preliminary PICO question, for example, would be out. Uh, the appraisal, you definitely follow these formal quality assessments, the ones that Susan went over. Uh, the most common one that you will have seen is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. Uh, so that's mostly, uh, actually always, for um, the evaluation of experimental research, intervention research. You will see it used incorrectly uh, for the evaluation of many other types of research, though. So the synthesis is uh, numerical if it's a meta-analysis. So if included in your review, you have studies where you can pool the data then you end up with you know one statistic that summarizes all of the studies whether that be an effect size whatnot with confidence intervals so it's a summary and pooling of the results of the studies that are included in the review if you can't summarize in an in a, uh, a statistic then it's a narrative summary so you'll see you know those summary tables of the results of the studies of the studies i could say that uh, one one thing that makes a difference whether or not you can do a meta-analysis is how homogeneous the studies are that you're looking at. Right. Uh, and then of importance, again, is that you need two or three reviewers, right? But we actually also were thinking that systematic, if we can go back to the idea of systematic as being, you know, transparent methods and using methods that are appropriate also actually includes uh, syntheses of qualitative research, right? And so there are many, many uh, different methods for metasyntheses, so these qualitative syntheses. And so they represent a family of methodological approaches to develop new knowledge based on rigorous analysis and interpretation. So the real important part, point here is that it's interpretation of existing knowledge. So a metasynthesis is sort of a catchphrase. You'll hear it used many different ways, though. Can have three different uh, purposes or types. There can be th theory explication. So concepts are fleshed out, resulting in new conceptualization of the original phenomena. So for example, thinking of uh, courage or chronicity in a different way. Theory building, uh, so findings from numerous studies uh, are integrated to push the level of theory beyond one single study. And some examples of theory building would be a grounded formal theory or a meta study. And you may be familiar with meta study. The developers were here, um, Barbara Patterson, Sally Thorne, Canham, and Jillings. Uh, and so meta study actually looks at not just the findings, but it also is a reflection on uh, the methods and the theory. Uh, and so it's a new interpretation of, of findings. And then the last type is uh, more descriptive. So findings are synthesized to have more of a comprehensive understanding of a phenomena. So the first type was really synthesis. Yeah, Gerti. For the very last type, it is more of a descriptive type. Yeah. Is that still distinguishable from the more so the big difference that I have seen in the descriptions is that these look more at deconstructing all parts of the different studies. So deconstructing the methods, the theory that goes into the individual study, whereas the descriptive just looks at reinterpreting the findings of individual studies. So these include reflections on the theory, on 
for example, whether you're combining a phenomenology and an ethnography and an interpretive description, for example, you'd reflect on how does that influence the findings, whereas the descriptive would just be looking at what are the findings and how can you summarize those in a new way. So this is purely qualitative. It's just drawing on qualitative studies. And it's a systematic review where the integrative reviews are less of something, less work, less. Yeah, yeah. You try to redefine every single thousand study. Yeah. And not all the parts that you just put on. So you go still by criteria. Yeah. But you look at the, at the more descriptive, qualitative matters of the findings. Yeah, and these wouldn't necessarily include things like gray literature, for example. They would be primarily based on empirical studies. Yeah. yeah. But it is a sliding scale, and you brought up integrative review. Uh, so, did it go twice? Ah, yeah. So, what I wanted to draw your attention to is some people would say, okay, now you're doing, going to do move and do a knowledge synthesis where you're going to have qualitative and quantitative research, right? So you're combining the two. We've first seen this where by people did traditional systematic reviews of quantitative research. And then they thought, oh, maybe some of the qualitative research can actually enhance what we're seeing. So that's sort of this enhancement model. We've seen that in some of the rapid reviews. But now people, I think, are shifting to this idea that the quantitative and the qualitative data are actually equal and complementary. So it's not that they follow that traditional hierarchy of evidence that we've seen, it's that they are held to be equal. And the focus is more on how do you actually go about combining those different types of studies. And so um, the, these syntheses of quantitative, qualitative, and they can also include mixed methods research. These types of syntheses are actually drawing on mixed methods research, you know, primary mixed methods research. And the idea is to concurrently examine qualitative, quantitative, and or mixed methods primary studies. Because we want to address these over lapping or complex questions that actually come up in practice. And we'd want to draw on the strengths of both the quantitative and the qualitative designs. So the idea is that they provide robust insight into really complex phenomena, that they might in, uh, inform the development of more complex <coughs> or real life interventions, and that they're really about interpretation to create new findings. So. One of the defining features is that it's interpretation. It's not just summary of existing data. What's tricky about these is that methods are rapidly, I think, um, being developed. And the methods that are used will really depend on the type of question that you're asking in the review. And that will also drive how you then integrate the qualitative and the quantitative aspects. So I'm just looking at time here. What I want to show you in this diagram, and this, this draws on ideas of mixed methods research. So there are some ways that are being developed for different ideas about when you integrate the quantitative and the qualitative findings. And so the big uh, difference here is you have the convergent syntheses or you have the sequential synthesis. So the convergence is you do the quantitative and the qualitative at the same time, and then thinking about how you integrate those findings. Whereas sequential, you would do one or the other first, and that would then inform the methods that you would do in the, in the subsequent aspects. And I'm just going to touch on realism very quickly because it's my favorite methodology right now. <laughs> and I'm looking at Moira because she's um, helping to bring realist reviews to UBC and to our school. Uh, so realist reviews recognize sort of the limitations of conventional systematic reviews that say that really they don't apply to complex interventions. And so systematic reviews are a theory-driven approach to investigate why do interventions work in some contexts and how. 
So you want to get to this question. What works, how, for whom, in what circumstances, and to what extent? And the Realist Review looks at trying to develop what we call these context mechanism outcome configurations. So context being the background, the mechanisms being the drivers for what happens, and then outcome being what happens, the outcome. Realist Review really does draw a more qualitative logic and methodology in that the search is interpretive and purposive. Uh, and the assessment of the relevant studies is more about the relevance to the developing theory, as opposed to using a quality assessment that kicks studies in or out. Okay. And the ultimate goal is really to build and refine theory, and it's based on this qualitative logic. So there's a couple resources here, but I'm, I'm going to skip over that slide. So a couple of things. So the question becomes, what differentiates systematic reviews from scoping reviews, integrative reviews, and rapid evidence assessment? Well, we were thinking uh, that it's a more exhaustive search when you're doing something of a systematic nature. Uh, we really think it requires a team. Um, and you need to have to come to consensus around the selected studies, but also how data is extracted, which quality appraisal tool to use, and then having two people do the quality appraisal to actually see what the agreement is and come to consensus. We also think in the more systematic reviews, uh, you need expertise to do those quality appraisals. The other area where you need expertise is sort of that linking of how does the methodology actually influence the findings. So understanding the relationship between methodology and findings and reflecting that in the review. So we wanted to come back to this idea of what is chapter two in people's um, theses or dissertation, the idea of differentiating between a literature review and a knowledge synthesis. And I wanted to include this topic because as I've seen a lot of master's that are completing, some of them, their chapter two is a scoping review, but it's not in their Yeah, and so the idea of chapter two being more, it's putting together the pieces of the puzzle to support the doing of somebody's research, right? So it's much more broadly focused. It's not focused on, you know, a researchable PIO or PICO question per se. It's not focused on um, identifying specific search criteria. So it's much more broad. It's more than just synthesizing the findings from existing studies based on one simple researchable question. It also involves reviewing literature with respect to theory, uh, theoretical foundations, and determining the opt optimal methods to support the doing of someone's study, conducting of someone's study. We also don't see in, in a, you know, a literature review to support a project, a formal quality appraisal. Having said that, it's important to identify where the gaps, where the strengths and limitations are in, in different bodies of literature. Yeah. So I think this is one of the most common questions that I have gotten as a supervisor. Yeah, Girti. I would put that under theory and theoretical foundations. So what are all the concepts and pieces that people need to draw on for their for their study? That's and, that was our the thinking. Other, uh, question I, I would have is, is to look at the chapter also so that the really try to synthesize or or, uh, or learn or articulate the sort of common lines of reasoning around the problem or the intervention um, in addition to either findings or concepts solving. That is also, I think, the difference between this chapter two versus um, 
all the methods that you just described. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, so will we have to reference you when we do this further work? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, I find it very valid question that you asked as to how how you distinguish, mm -hmm. and I do think that there is um, some element. I, I don't know if it's uh, if, if anybody even <coughs> discusses that explicitly. Uh, no, and it goes beyond when we were thinking about theory concepts. And so just a couple of concluding thoughts. Uh, in terms of the current state of synthesis, we have found that the terminology is confusing and inconsistent across the board. Uh, that the methods to conducting knowledge synthesis are rapidly evolving. Uh, but we also wanted to point out that even though something is systematic, it's not prescriptive. And that there is an art to doing knowledge synthesis that still is absolutely essential. So drawing on uh, you know, critically thinking about the literature and what's most appropriate in terms of um, methods of doing a knowledge synthesis, as opposed to just drawing from, you know, a checklist or a guide to doing a systematic or knowledge synthesis. Uh, so a couple of key, well, one key message, uh, to select the most appropriate review, we thought that the purpose of actually doing the review and the questions being asked really needs to drive the, uh, the knowledge synthesis method that's being selected. Um, also of importance is available time and resources because knowledge synthesis methods, particularly with a number of reviewers, can be very time and resource intensive. As well, the team member composition and expertise is, of course, important. So yeah, that's all we had. <laughs> Of yeah, and, and we really um, grappled with a lot of questions and wanted to uh, sort of ask you what some of the issues that you have encountered, but also what are the, you know, roles and responsibilities of faculty and students in doing knowledge synthesis. <laughs>